public lecture with Derek Hensler uh, entitled Between Honor and Authenticity, Zionism of Theodore Herzl's Life Project. I want to flag that this talk is co-hosted by the Berkeley Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies and the Center for Jewish Studies at UC Berkeley. And before turning the floor over to Professor John Efron, I want to flag a few important upcoming events. You've seen some of the flyers, but I'll also flag them here. Um, first of all, please join us for our major spring event, our major spring conference entitled Reflections on the Legacy of Nuremberg, the 70th Anniversary of the Nuremberg Trials. Have, there's a full agenda in the back if you haven't picked one up. And I'll flag a couple of different, it really has three parts to it. Um, the first part is an evening film screening entitled Nuremberg, It's Lesson for Today. And that will be at the Magnus on Monday evening. Uh, the second part is an all-day conference uh, at the Bancroft Hotel with three separate panels um, and with very prominent historians and legal scholars, with our very own Professor John Efron, who is a co-organizer, uh, moderating one of the panels as well. And the full agenda, as I noted, is right here. And the third part is um, a keynote address by uh, Justice Rosalie Abella of the Canadian Supreme Court of Canada, who will be speaking on justice after Nuremberg. So those are going on next week, Monday, April 27th, and Tuesday, April 28th. So I want to flag those. I also want to flag, uh, by the Center for Jewish Studies, um, another, uh, another talk, which is going on this Friday from 4 to 6 with uh, author, Pulitzer Prize winning author Philip Schultz entitled The Wherewithal, a novel in verse. So there's a lot of things going on as the semester ends and I wanted to flag those. Now I want to also introduce Professor John Efron who will be introducing our guest speaker today. <coughs> professor John Efron, who many of you know, is the correct professor of Jewish history at Berkeley. He is in the history department. He's affiliated with the Center for Jewish Studies and also affiliated with the Berkeley Institute for Jewish Law and Israel Studies. I may have also omitted some other affiliations within the university as well. Um, he specializes in the cultural and social history of German Jewry, and his scholarship focuses on the ways that German Jewry have attempted to reinterpret and reinvent Jewish culture in the wake of modernity. And he's recently published a manuscript as well called Sephardic Beauty and the Ashkenazic Imagination, German Jewry in the Age of Emancipation, among several other publications um, as well. So please welcome Professor John Efron. Uh, yes, well, enough about me. And we're here, we're here to uh, hear Derek Pensoir. Um, Derek is the uh, Stanley Lewis Professor of Modern Israel Studies at Oxford. He's also the Samuel Zaks Professor of European Jewish History at the University of Toronto. Uh, Derek is from California, a native of this state. He got his BA at uh, Stanford and took his PhD in our history department here at oh. Berkeley. Um, just as Derek has uh, two jobs, he holds the rare distinction of being a recognized authority in two distinct fields of history, European Jewish history and also the history of Israel. Now, by distinct, what I mean is that each has its very own well-developed uh, literature as well as methodological approaches and intellectual agendas. That said, what makes Derek's work so valuable is that while honoring and respecting the differences, he's, he has never been bound by them. In all of his work, where possible and appropriate, he has sought to break down the barriers between the two, especially when it comes to incorporating the history of Israel into Jewish history. <clears throat> and he has consistently pushed back against the cultural, the psychological, and indeed the institutional impulses in Israel to separate Israeli history from Jewish history. Uh, for those who are unaware, uh, at many universities in Israel, Israel studies and, is, and, and the history of Israel is taught separately in a separate department from uh, either Jewish history or general history. Anyway, Derek's approach has been most manifest in books such as Zionism and Technocracy, The Engineering of Jewish Settlement in Palestine, 1870 to 1918, in which he looks at 
uh, German Jewish technicians, agronomists, and other and other <coughs> German Jews with technical skills who came to Palestine to help uh, develop the land. Shylock's Children: Economics and Jewish Identity in Modern Europe is about the uh, the place of economics, it's of an economic Jewish history, and the place of philanthropy within European Jewish society, but it also the, 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 the final part of the book also focuses on Zionism and um, the support of settlements uh, in the 19th century. Another book to be co-edited on Orientalism and the Jews, Israel <coughs> in History, the Jewish State in Comparative Perspective, and, and also a more recent collection of documents called The Origins of Israel, 1882 to 1948. Derek's currently writing Two, two new books, one on Zionism for the Rutgers University Press series entitled Keywords, and another which is a biography of Herzl for the Yale University Press's Jewish Life series, and that is the, uh, the talk that he's going to give us, that we're going to hear momentarily, is based on research for that book. So uh, the title that we're about to hear is Between Honor and Authenticity, Zionism, and Theodore Herzl's Life Project. Please join me in welcoming Derek Pensler back to Berkeley. Thank you, uh, John, for the very kind introduction. Hold on, let me make sure this, does this work? Can you hear it? Yeah, great. Uh, thank you for the uh, introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's always nice to be invited to give a talk somewhere, but of course, it's particularly nice to be invited back to one's alma mater. I have actually two, I was at Stanford, first degree, Berkeley after that, so I was at Stanford just yesterday, and now I'm back here. Um, I guess since I'm on videotape, I better not say which I prefer, but let's just put it this way. Um, I think the architecture is much prettier here. So, um, now, as John said, uh, this uh, talk is an academic article, or actually a book chapter, that is coming out of material for a book for a general public. The uh, Yale Jewish Life series are books that are meant for, um, for non-academics, or certainly for non-specialists, which is uh, a challenge for academics. I have to uh, adopt a very different style of, of approaching the subject, but I think it's a very good thing for academics to, to do such a thing. And as um, I've been told, books for the general public tend to be um, story-driven narrative driven rather than ar argument driven. But this is a chance for me to, and in a few other articles I've written, for me to present arguments and develop them as academics do. And in this uh, talk, based on this book chapter, I'm interested in the concept of a life project. And it's a term that sounds very Germanic, I suppose, but it's a term that I, I came up with to describe a set of goals and practices that endow a person's life with meaning uh, and, and, and with direction. A life project is both more specific, but it's also more all-encompassing than careerist ambition or desire to accumulate material possessions or, or a yearning for personal fulfillment through romantic relationships. A life project transcends these pedestrian aspirations and its devotion to a cause, a belief, an ideology, yet it is nourished by the same psychological needs and drives that underlie all human behavior. From the mid-1890s, Zionism became Theodor Herzl's life project. At this time, Zionism became the latest manifestation of an ongoing attempt by Herzl to attain both honor and authenticity. Now, these two concepts, honor and authenticity, are overlapping and yet distinct. And in fact, at times, they're contradictory. Honor refers to a sensibility that self-worth depends upon following a certain code of behavior, even when it's not convenient or personally beneficial to do so. Honor is usually associated with qualities such as resolve, courage, self-sacrifice, and loyalty. Honor is also associated with honesty and fair play, for example, in gaming or in sport. But codes of honor can demand reticence, holding one's tongue, even downright dissemblance so long as such behavior is altruistic and not self-serving. Simply put, honor does not demand a constant unremitting display of transparency towards others, nor does honor necessarily demand authenticity. Now, authenticity is a much more fraught term than honor, 
with deep philosophical roots in the writings of, among others, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and Sartre. Now, it is especially tempting, given Aristotle's uh, li living at the uh, fin de siècle in Central Europe, to relate Herzl to his contemporary Nietzsche's concept of authenticity, ectite. Um, direct evidence of Nietzschean influence on Herzl, however, is scant. There is an intellectual historian who has tried to demonstrate that Herzl was a Nietzschean through selective quotations from Herzl's writings and the fact that Herzl had Nietzsche's books in his library. If someone were to go through my library and look at all the books in my library and determine that therefore I was influenced by X, Y, Z, I think they'd probably be mistaken. Also, I, I think it's very important to, and this is one of the things I'm going to emphasize in the biography, without any disrespect to Herzl, though I think was a fascinating figure, he was not a deep or original thinker. Uh, he, was, he, he was an excellent journalist. He had a capacity for sizing up physical space. He could describe this room and the people in it with great talent. I, I see his political writings, for example, on Jewish causes much more as manifestos than as, um, you know, works of original. I, I was asked once recently if I saw him as a political theorist, and I think the answer is no. He was a journalist and a political, a, a political leader. And so to talk about Herzl to Nietzsche, and I think, is a bit perhaps, um, perhaps a misperceived. Instead, what I would do is put Herzl within a broad swath of fin de siècle Central European writers who championed self-awareness and purposefulness to become, and again here to quote Nietzsche, what you already are. Now, as I hope to show, as difficult as it was for Herzl to perceive himself as a man of honor, it was an even more difficult, in fact, impossible for him to attain authenticity. The very act of striving towards these two affective states, honor and authenticity, however, fueled his Zionist passion and sustained him during the nine brief years during which he irrevocably transformed the Jewish world. And it really is quite remarkable. He turns to Zionism in 1895, he dies in 1904, at the age of 44. And so it's, it's incredible uh, what he did in those nine short years. Now, the study of Herzl's life is enriched and challenged by the vast corpus of his writings. In addition to hundreds of pieces published in his own lifetime, Herzl kept a diary between 1882 and 1885, and some 6,000 letters written by Herzl over his lifetime have survived. The diary and the letters were published in a critical edition in Germany in the 1980s and 90s. The most commonly cited source by Herzl's biographers, of whom there are about 200, <laughs> which makes my project even more challenging, uh, are his, what are called Zielische Tagebücher, the Zionist diaries, composed from 1895 until his death. And the unabridged diaries are also available in English for those who are interested, published in 1960. The diaries begin, interestingly, with a brief autobiographical sketch and contain some highly uh, interesting passages from June of 1895. Now, in June of 1895, Herzl experienced what appears to have been a manic episode during which he wrote hundreds of pages, some of it lucid and brilliant, some of it truly mad, and out of which came much of the text of Herzl's famous pamphlet of 1896, Der Judenstadt. The Zionist diaries constitute both a public and a private text. On the one hand, an expression of Herzl's innermost feelings with flashes of self-awareness and revealing passages of internal dialogue. But on the other hand, a record of his self-presentation planned or performed to the world. In the first entry of June of 1895, Herzl writes of, quote, the honesty inherent in this diary which would be completely worthless if I played the hypocrite with myself. And yet from early on, he considered publishing the diaries as a record of, quote, what I have had to put up with, who have been the enemies of my plan, and on the other hand, who stood by me. So he's already looking forward to the settling of grievances um, by publishing the, the diary. The political scientist Shlomo Avineri has called the diaries a Bildungsroman, an account of encounters with the world, the passage from innocence to experience, and from fantasy to pragmatism. I wouldn't quite put it that way. I would see the diaries rather as more superficial than a Bildungsroman or a classic autobiography, which Marcus Mosley, in his definitive study of modern Jewish life writing, nicely describes as a study of the self's becoming and fashioning. Autobiography privileges perception and feeling over action. Childhood receives disproportionate attention as the time when the self 
and his relationship with the world are established. Herzl's diaries do not tell the story of his personal formation. They are an account of action in real time. However, if they're read critically and carefully, along with other writings by Herzl to serve as points of confirmation or contrast, the diaries do provide a lens through which to ascertain Herzl's emotional state, especially given the diaries' generous helpings of self-aggrandizement, depression, hypochondriasis, and self-pity. In this sense, the diaries maintain the spirit of that pioneer of life writing, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, whose confessions proclaim, quote, I suffered before I learned to think. Unlike other biographers of Herzl, my own work in progress situates Herzl as a Zionist leader by drawing on scholarly literature on leadership, charisma, and the psychology of political leaders. I've published elsewhere on Herzl's charisma as a relational construct that depends as much upon social context in which the charismatic leader lives as upon the leader <coughs> him or herself. Here, however, I want to focus on Herzl's interiority, in particular the striving of a deeply troubled individual to construct a stable persona with a will to live and to engage the world. Most of Herzl's biographers have focused on his troubled relationship with his own Jewishness. Encounters with anti-Semitism were hurtful and humiliating, and this sense of humiliation and shame catalyzed an internalization of anti-Semitism and a harsh critique of his fellow Jews. But the psychic origins of Herzl's life project lay not in Jewishness or anti-Semitism as such, certainly not in them alone. Anterior to Herzl's construction of the Jews and his own Jewish self-ascription was an unresolved struggle to find meaning in life, to win recognition, which was the only means of overcoming his chronic and powerful depression. Herzl was a darkly unhappy man, given to the blackest of moods. Although he never seriously planned to end his life, he did suffer from bouts of depression at the age of 19, again at 23, when his theatrical career appeared stalled, his love life was in tatters, and he resigned from his student fraternity because of endemic anti-Semitism. The turn to Zionism taken to give his life meaning and purpose offered no immediate uh, solution to Herzl's ailment. Herzl fell into a funk in 1896, when after only a few months of Zionist activity, he had failed to attain a charter for the Ottoman Sultan. In that same year, Herzl published a feuilleton about an unhappily married man on the verge of drowning himself, but who was saved thanks to a chance encounter with an eccentric inventor. And in this story, the um, inventor tells the miserable would-be suicide. It's an interesting quotation from this uh, feuilleton. Despair is a precious substance from which the most wonderful things may be generated. Courage, self-denial, resolution, sacrifice. To the stubbornness, I recommend self-realization and a great task. They have achieved the most. As I look back in the past, it seems to me that all of the great men of history were once at the river's edge, but turned back. Their despair bore fruit. All discoverers, prophets, heroes, statesmen, artists, even philosophers, for one, never philosophizes better than when staring death in the face. Depression, and indeed, the determination to overcome it, has been common among great leaders, and there are intriguing parallels on this point between Herzl and, for example, Winston Churchill, whose psyche was trenchantly analyzed by Anthony Storr in his classic essay of 1989, Churchill's Black Dog. <coughs> According to Storr, had Churchill, and I'm quoting him, being a stable and equitable man, he could never have inspired the nation. Storr tells us that Churchill's triumphant moment in 1940, like Herzl's in 1896, was made possible because, quote, all his life he had conducted a battle with his own despair that made it possible to convey to others that despair can be overcome, end quote. Churchill's novel, Savrola, of 1897, begins almost identically to Herzl's Alt Neuland, with a 30-something man steeped in melancholy, overcome by work, worry, jaded, nervous, and emotionally enervated. As a young man, Churchill and Herzl alike were consumed by shame, for Herzl his boyhood frailty and cowardice, for young Herzl his rejection from military service on medical grounds, and his contraction of gonorrhea from a prostitute. Herzl was also ashamed of avoiding fighting duels whilst a university student. Both men catapulted between self-deprecation and self-aggrandizement. 
Churchill wrote very much in the Herzlian mode when he claimed, we are all worms, but I am a glowworm. <laughs> both men were preoccupied by thoughts of death, and both were hypochondriac. For these men, the aspiration to political leadership stemmed from something deeper than ambition or power or material gain. The belief in their heroic mission was a means of fulfilling deep-seated psychic needs. It's precisely because Herzl and Churchill were not balanced or rational entirely that they could inspire the public in a time of crisis, a crisis that corresponded to the perpetual sense of imminent catastrophe with which they lived on a daily basis. Now, psychically, Herzl was in many ways more fragile than Churchill. He was a desperately lonely man, stuck in a catastrophic marriage to a woman even more mentally unbalanced than he. Herzl had some youthful, rather mechanical dalliances, and he appears to have felt a volcanic, albeit ephemeral, erotic attraction to his wife, Julie, whose kisses set him afire when they met in 1886. He was 26, she was 18. And who gave birth to their first child scarcely eight months after their wedding. Yet the marriage to Julie quickly soured, and after that, Herzl never found, or apparently even sought, sexual satisfaction with individuals of either gender. He was too narcissistic to be capable of mature conjugal love, or even of sustained platonic friendship. His only true friend, Heinrich Kana, a journalist, committed suicide in 1891. Tellingly, when Herzl received the news of Kana's suicide, he abandoned Julie, who was five months pregnant, and decamped for Italy and France, returning to Vienna only during the final weeks of the pregnancy, and then fleeing to Spain two months after the birth of his son Hans. It was, by the way, on these misery-induced European trips that Herzl wrote some of his finest travel feuilletons, which caught the eyes of the editors of the Neue Freie Presse, and then offered him the position as that newspaper's Paris correspondent. Not surprisingly, peripatetic and broken-hearted men litter his novel Old Newland, the protagonist, Herzl's alter ego, Friedrich Lohenberg, the crusty Prussian aristocrat, King's Court, and even King's Court's Tahitian servant have all loved and lost, and now they prefer to seek the companionship of men, circumnavigating the globe by ship and sojourning for decades on an isolated South Pacific island. Loneliness was a source and a product of Herzl's melancholy temper, but shame is what drove him to seek honor. Shame over what he perceived as physical witness and cowardice led Herzl to exalt allegedly Prussian aristocratic values such as manliness, stolidity, strength of character, self-discipline, direct speech, and decisiveness. Herzl juxtaposed all those qualities against those of Jews, who even in Herzl's most mature writings are often depicted in stereotypically even anti-Semitic terms, as crass and venal, for example. Herzl was wont to portray Jewish women in a particularly grotesque way, as bedecked with jewels and displaying fallen décolletage. Herzl's finest play, The New Ghetto of 1894, is filled with unpleasant Jewish characters, although it also features a corrupt and aristocratic mine owner who at the play's end fights a duel and kills the, with and kills the hero, Jacob Samuel. <coughs> Jacob Samuel, another alter ego for Herzl, Jacob being his father's name. And Jacob, earlier in the play, says that after failing to attempt, or failing in his attempts to assimilate into Christian society, he has realized that Jews must learn, quote, how to bow without subservience and stand tall without truculence. Paradoxically, Herzl's yearnings to behave with honor led him to exempt himself from his infamous proposal of 1893 that Jews undergo a mass conversion to Catholicism. Herzl claimed that he would remain Jewish out of what he called, quote, filial loyalty and manly pride. To invoke terminology made famous later by Hannah Arendt, Herzl would always be the proud pariah and never the parvenu. It was the sense of being a pariah that caused Herzl to identify with the hapless Captain Alfred Dreyfus. Now true, at the time of Dreyfus's first trial, Herzl wrote little of the matter, did not assume Dreyfus's innocence, and did not protest the verdict. But by 1899, Herzl had changed his tune. As many scholars have written, I, I'm not by any means the first to point this out, that Herzl invented the myth of the Dreyfus affair, having turned him to Zionism in a piece he wrote in 1899. In this 
essay of 1899, he misdated or he changed the dating of his play, The New Ghetto, to make it appear as if he had written it after the trial. He actually finished it a month beforehand. Now, how do we read Herzl's Volt Fuss? Perhaps it was a canny act of self-invention at a time when the Dreyfus trial had ballooned into the Dreyfus affair, Emile Zola's and Jacques had galvanized the world, and the fortunes of Zionism could benefit if the movement's leader could claim to have foreseen the tragic import of the arrest and show trial and brutal punishment of this uh, army officer. But Herzl clearly identified with Dreyfus's love of the state and his sense of duty. Herzl wrote that any Jew who had advanced so far as to become an officer on the general staff would never betray his country. It was psychologically impossible. This is in the writings of 1899. It's really rather prescient in that he's writing about Dreyfus. And from another book I've written on the relationship between Jews and the military, I do a kind of prosopography of Jews who became army officers in fin de siècle of France, of whom there were approximately 800 to 1,000, many of whom had ranks much higher than Dreyfus. Um, Herzl writes, because the Jews were deprived of the honors of citizenship for such a long time, the Jews have a desire for the honors of citizenship that frequently border on the pathological. And in this respect, a Jewish army officer is a Jew raised to the nth degree. So for Herzl then, Zionism aspires to restore <coughs> Jews to their ancient homeland, but really as a means to restore them to honor. And it's precisely for this reason that Herzl was able to envision a thriving diaspora that would coexist alongside the Jewish state. The existence of the state in and of itself, Herzl believed, would endow Jews the world over with a sense of honor. And once the state was in place, so he believed, Jews would be respected by Gentiles as a normal people, grounded in a territory <coughs> that would be developed in an exemplary fashion. Jews would no longer be rootless cosmopolitans whose exceptionality stimulated the formation amongst Gentiles of chronic and ultimately uh, destructive anxiety. So when Herzl testified in 1902 in London before the Royal Commission on Alien Immigration, he made it very clear that his Zionist vision left room for many Jews to stay in place. Asked if he demanded that every Jew leave England or the entirety of Europe, Herzl replied, you must leave that to every man for himself, and he must decide whether he will assimilate or not, whether he will go to another nation or belong to his sister nation. It is not right to influence a man to do it, except by putting arguments before him and letting forces, his English was imperfect, I think he means natural forces, work. <coughs> now, on one level, this quotation refers to the rights of free humans to choose where they want to live. But the full meaning of this quote emerges when comparing it with a key theme in Herzl's novel, Alt Neuland, which was published in the same year as his testimony before the commission. In the novel, people have often read the novel selectively, we know that poor and persecuted Jews have moved to a utopian society. But what's also in the novel is that the immigration of Jews and the creation of this new society have caused Gentiles to appreciate Jews to the point that they beg the Jews not to leave. This is as much a part of the book, in a way, although it's in the background. Once the new society, that's what the Jewish community of Palestine is called, has been created, Jews in diaspora may stay abroad. They may even, if they wish, convert to Christianity. But they will do so out of pure belief, without any instrumental intent. They will now be endowed with complete freedom and untainted honor. One of the last scenes in Al Boylan, and really the most momentous, takes place in Jerusalem on the Sabbath Eve in the rebuilt temple, where the novel, yes, the temple is rebuilt, where the novel's hero, Friedrich Lohenberg, reflects upon Jewish honor. He recalls that in the ghetto, and now I'm quoting Herzl, the Jews were without honor, without rights, without justice, without defense. And when they left the ghetto, they ceased to be Jews. But a man to be a man must have both freedom and the feeling of community. And only when the Jews had both could they rebuild the house of the invisible and almighty God. Now, this reference to the divinity comes up in the very last sentence of the novel, where a venerable rabbi invokes God as the source of the Jew's salvation. Now, this is a melodramatic flourish. Herzl was not a believer. 
and his writings often feature a quite, uh, a quite acid anti-clericalism. Yet his anti-clerical nylon is replete with long monologues that closely resemble theatrical soliloquies. This is no surprise, as a dramatic performative quality penetrated all of Herzl's activity as a Zionist, a journalist, and of course, a playwright. I'm very well aware that I'm at the university that was the home of the great Karl Shorsky, the author of the seminal article, now a half century old, on politics in a new key about Herzl as part of kind of fin de siècle post-liberal political theater. Just as Herzl would read the entire scripts of his plays to prospective producers, directors, and cast members, so was he wont to read lengthy memoranda or even the entirety of his pamphlet, Der Judenstadt, to current or would-be supporters of the Zionist cause. Now, there was no internet in the late 19th century, so I suppose people did this for entertainment, but I'm really wondering uh, if this might have lost him some supporters. Herzl saw nothing dishonorable about performance, per se, as long as the motives were sincere. Now, um, I'm aware that this is the, uh, I'm, my talk is being sponsored by a center for uh, law as well as Israel studies or uh, Jewish law. So I have to here uh, invoke Herzl's play, Die Glosse, The Gloss of 1895, the story of one Philippus of Monteperto, a lawyer in 13th century Bologna, who wins back his adulterous wife by dramatically reciting to her a Roman marriage code. <laughs> Let me know if it works. <laughs> but there's, a, there's, there's something important about this notion of recitation. The act of recitation in Alt Neulon has the power to inspire as well as to educate. So there's a scene in the novel where an engineering expert named Joe Levy proclaims the technological wonders of the new society via a gramophone recording played at a Passover Seder. Like the Haggadah, the recitation is long, rather tedious, and absolutely central to a narrative of the enslavement and liberation of the Jews. There's no contradiction necessarily between performance and honor. Rituals by which honor is asserted or reaffirmed are performative acts. As Herzl wrote to Kana at the age of 23, it seems you don't really uh, yet understand the key to my character because I make a show of presenting myself as wide open. I do not always speak the truth, not even often, yet I am a sincere animal. And if I do often lie, I, only do, I do not do so if there's no advantage in it. <laughs> Being true to oneself does not necessarily demand transparency or truthfulness towards the world, but there is a fine line between maintaining a duality between internal and external self-representation in order to promote personal honor and simply lying to others for one's self-interest. And Herzl, I suspect, was deeply concerned with issues of sincerity and hypocrisy. The title of Herzl's feuilleton collection, The Book of Folly, Das Buch der Nachheit, 1888, is taken from the epigram at the beginning of Jonathan Swift's Tale of a Tub, the serene and peaceful state of being a fool amongst knaves. Another feuilleton collection, News from Venus, the title, by the way, caused it to be censored, although it was really quite tame, but the News from Venus, begins with this epigram. All men are at the start good, or as I call it, genuine. But then something happens, but the lapse of time, and they all become shams. Criticism of social norms and the exposure of hypocrisy were staples of the era's literature, such as the psychologically fraught plays of Henry Gibson or the thunderous polemics of Max Nordau. This critique takes a rather simplistic form in many of Herzl's short stories, one about a person who can read minds and therefore can uh, become privy to the hypocrisy that underlies our, uh, even our most beneficial actions. Herzl's uh, theatrical comedies were, as typical of the genre and the era, filled with deceivers who then become deceived. But this plot device takes on a particularly dark uh, uh, quality in Alt Neuland, where Miriam Litvak, a virtuous woman, the incarnation of Herzl's deceased sister Pauline, quotes Goethe, crucify every dreamer who reaches his 30th year. Once he has known the world, the deceived becomes the deceiver. From childhood, Herzl's affect in fact, was, was, was somewhat deceptive, aloof, 
poised, defensive. And these characteristics seem to have intensified during his adolescence after an unrequited schoolboy crush on a girl named Madeline Hertz, the daughter of family acquaintances, and also by Pauline's death in 1878. The death of his sister devastated Herzl, uh, but he never wrote about it really with candor in his, public, in his public writings. Some level of concealment or displacement of personal feeling is to be expected in any kind of public life writing. So this is not so surprising. Um, so, for example, Herzl misrepresents why he left his job as an attorney. He was a state attorney in Salzburg. And he claims in his autobiographical writings that he left because of anti-Semitism, which would keep him from becoming a judge. But that's not true. He left because he fulfilled his one year of minimum service and he wanted to go on with his theatrical career. So he mm -hmm. kind of, he's, but this is, uh, authenticity can survive a bit of creative storytelling. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not arguing you have to always you know, be completely transparent. But authenticity does demand a high level of self-awareness. And in this sense, Herzl was sorely lacking. Herzl was apparently unaware that he developed a posthumous love for his sister that fused fraternal and erotic elements. So much so that in Alt Neulon, his alter ego, Friedrich, marries the virtuous Miriam. Moreover, Herzl did not find anything untoward about a romantic infatuation he developed at the age of 26 with Madeline Herzl's 14-year-old niece, whom Herzl had held in his arms as an infant. Madeline, by the way, died tragically uh, two years after Pauline. It was shortly after this odd infatuation that Herzl met the beautiful 18-year-old Julie Naschauer. As I mentioned, they had a kind of flirtatious first meeting. And then Herzl, and he writes about this with this kind of, he seems to be unaware of his own feelings. He's overcome by desire, but also inexplicable disgust and self-hatred what he describes as wild nausea, and it drives him to consider suicide. Torn between eros, repulsion, and fear of sexual maturity and marital responsibility, Herzl ran away from Vienna and traveled for several months tormented by psychosomatic pains. And then three years later, when his theatrical and journalistic career were going along pretty well, he returned to Julie, married her, but unfortunately the marriage did not turn out to be a successful one. In his youth, Herzl had been frank and even ribald in writings to his friend Kana, for example, about his sexual encounters. And there's more than a touch of adolescent boasting in these writings. But what's most striking about them is an underlining tone of anxiety when he says that the act of sex and the act of, of writing a novel can drain you and, and, and destroy you. And it, it seems to me that Herzl, this was one of the reasons, this fear of, of, of women and, and of the power they can have over him, which is what led him to content himself with fantasies of, of, of virginal, unattainable girls. This obsession mars some of his most mature and, and uh, revealing stories. For example, one of 1902, in, in the last years of his life, Herzl's fiction became more sophisticated, more mature, higher quality, we would say. His story, Die Brille, of 1902, is an epistolary account to an unknown recipient for a middle-aged man who has acquired his first pair of reading glasses and he dwells upon their melancholy meaning. So I'm quoting Herzl. Reading glasses are the border, the watershed. From here on, the water flows to the other side. The glasses are the official beginning of old age. First we lose our looks, then our passion, and reading is our only remaining pleasure. So in this short story, I forgot to bring my reading glasses, so it's kind of hard to so bear in mind back. Um, Herzl offers a, also some rather encouraging comments about aging, about the ability to see things from distance, but not close up, which reflects a kind of sense of, of, of perspective. And in the story, as he's writing these lines to his unknown um, interlocutor or correspondent, Herzl, the narrator of the story, sees or actually perceives a young woman enter the room. It's really very beautiful. He cannot see her but he catches the scent of her perfume, and he hears the rustle of his dress. And he abandons any attempt to engage her with conversation or flirt with her. He does not attempt to hide the glasses in her presence. He does not attempt to conceal his age. And these reflections appear rather mature, but the story at its very end notes that this blurry-faced woman reminds him of a 14-year-old girl he had loved in his youth. And it's unclear here if he is reminiscing about Madeline or her niece, but in either case, Herzl appears to be rather stuck in memories 
rather than embracing the present, which is the opposite of the story's explicit directive. Herzl invented a far more virile hero in another late story, Epaphroditus, <clears throat> which was closely adapted from Plutarch's Life of Sulla. Herzl had an excellent classical education. His Greek and Latin were flawless, and he often uh, <clears throat> invoked uh, motifs from classic literature. In Herzl's rendering, the Roman dictator Sulla has stepped down from power to, um, uh, to embrace and enjoy private life, <clears throat> including sensual pleasure. For example, in this story, uh, Herzl has the former uh, dictator uh, die, in his enemies, die in the arms of his enemy's mistress. Now, <clears throat> there's more than a hint of identification here with a charismatic self-made dictator, surrounded by scheming enemies, and of wish fulfillment in the beauteous mistress and the death that grants him peace. And it's intriguing that here, the mistress is not an infet. The mistress is a, a woman, a grown woman, and yet bearing the scars, it seems, of his relationships with women, Herzl cannot separate erotic union from destruction. Herzl adds to Plutarch's tale a story in which a centurion upbraids Sulla for walking unarmed in the public square. The centurion sees this behavior as a sign of weakness, yet for Sulla, in Herzl's rendering, walking in public, or as Herzl says, exposed, is the highest expression of masculine strength. Very different from Herzl's response to the writing of the New Ghetto in 1894, which he sent under a pseudonym. Well, actually, he wrote to his friend Arthur Schnitzler and said, please submit this to the Burgtheater under a pseudonym. As he wrote to Schnitzler at the time, I long to hide to go underground. In the special instance of this play, I want to hide my genitals more than any other time. He's <laughs> talking about his, his circumcised penis. In his journalistic writings and plays, Herzl praised authenticity, but it was difficult to achieve it for him in real life. Zionism became means by which he could, as it were, expose his genitals, that is, the uncircumcised, uh, sorry, the circumcised penis, by proclaiming attachment to the people that bore that mark. And thanks to Zionism, he would do so with pride and with dignity. In the first entry to his Zionist diary, Herzl compares Jews to seals, who after ages of living entirely in the sea, have, due to Darwinian selection, come to look like fish. If they were to return to dry land, their fins, he writes, would soon turn back to feet. Now let's leave aside for a moment the implications of this metaphor. Seals, in fact, live their lives in both water and on land. So perhaps Jews are meant to live in both the diaspora and their own country. The point is that, for Herzl, Zionism provides an opportunity to be authentic, but only for him by assuming a role, that of the proud and dissimilating Jew. Herzl had an easier time writing with sophistication, honesty, and genuine awareness, self-awareness, about parental love, rather than um, uh, marital relations or erotic relations. Several of Herzl's feuilletons offer engaging meditations on his children's childhood, his brevity, the pleasures of the nursery, and so on. He writes with keen insight about child development and the inability of adults to comprehend or to appreciate that magical experience. These sentimental feuilletons, though, should not blind us to the fact that Herzl was away from his children nine months out of 12, and that he frequently mis, uh, uh, mistook their age. Um, when you write their birthdays, he would get their, their age as well. Considerably more disturbing, though, than paternal absence or absent-mindedness is the ease with which the feuilletons about childhood cross the line from wistful to melancholy, and from melancholy to macabre. For example, in one feuilleton, Herzl has a waking nightmare of his daughter's death. In another, stray and pet birds, stray animals and pet birds, die with regularity and are buried in the garden. These gloomy and gothic ruminations pale in comparison, though, with the fevered dream of a Herzlian royal dynasty that Herzl envisioned for his future Jewish state in the June 1895 diary entries. Herzl writes that his father Jacob would be the first senator of the Jewish state. His son Hans would be the doge. Herzl envisioned a coronation ceremony with cuirassiers, artillery, infantry, marching in gold-studded gala uniforms. The doge himself will wear the garb of shame of a medieval ghetto Jew, the pointed hat, the yellow badge. Only inside the temple we wrap a princely cloak about his shoulders and place a crown upon his head. Herzl writes that he cried at the grandeur of his own vision and of crowning his son Hans 
as Doge. As I said at the outset, it appears that Herzl was experiencing a manic episode at the time, and indeed, he feared for his own sanity. The bond between genius and insanity crops up frequently in Herzl's published writings, as in one essay from 1895, which ends with, the imaginations of madmen are much more colorful, wild, majestic, and frightful than those of Shakespeare. Herzl's psychological disturbances call into question the very possibility of authenticity. How could Herzl have a lucid, realistic view of himself given his uh, psychological disturbances? Including delusions of grandeur, Herzl apparently told his first biographer, Reuben Branham, that as a child he dreamed of conversing with Moses and of being called the Messiah. Now, we don't know if Herzl actually had that dream, but whether he had the dream or not is not the issue. The point is, he told, we believe um, that he actually told this to Reuben Brain, and I've never seen it, it denied. Uh, so, that uh, I, I believe it's, it, it's true. But there's another problem we're running into with Herzl as a political leader, because even if we consider him sane, uh, do we apply concepts of authenticity, not to mention honor, to a politician? <laughs> That's a serious question. Uh, Herzl was fully capable of devious and manipulative behavior, like all political leaders are, but uh, it does appear that there were certain principles he would not compromise. Uh, it was hard for Herzl to achieve authenticity, but he seemed to sustain a certain degree of honor even when immersed in his uh, backfighting Zionist politics or his international diplomacy. Now, Herzl liked to call himself a statesman, not a politician. But in fact, Herzl could display, could display unstatesmanlike qualities. He could not abide criticism from his lieutenants. He could be petulant, even savage, when dealing with his opponents. He was not averse to playing internal foes against each other. But again, this is pretty typical for a political leader. Herzl's diplomatic activity was consistently opportunistic. When uh, he began in 1896 to seek the favor of the Ottoman Sultan, he ensured that the Neue Freie Presse would present the Ottoman government in a favorable light regarding the Armenian question. In his contacts with the Ottomans, Herzl avowed that an imperial charter to Jews to settle Palestine would help the empire to maintain its independence and its territorial integrity. But at the same time, he was courting European powers, mainly Britain and uh, Germany, for a protectorate. Now, in international diplomacy, opportunism is hardly dishonorable. And the only difference between Herzl and his interlocutors was that they had more power and they played the game more effectively than he did. Moreover, Herzl appears to have genuinely believed, this wasn't a fantasy, I mean it was a fantasy, but it was based on a genuine belief that he could form a syndicate of Jewish bankers who would raise vast loans for the Ottoman Empire and underwrite the empire's burgeoning debts. And although Herzl was a great apologist for European colonialism, and happily hitched his fortunes uh, of Zionism to the European power's global expansion, he had a clear-headed understanding of European colonialism's limitations as well as its strengths. In a colorful feuilleton in 1903, written in Egypt, Herzl gushes that the Egyptians should feel fortunate to be occupied by the British, but he also observes that the nationalist sentiments of educated Egyptian youth and predicts that Britain's days in Egypt are numbered. The historian Benny Morris has mused that if Herzl had access to formidable military power, he would have taken Palestine by force. True, at the outset of his Zionist activity, Herzl did strike a bellicose note. As he wrote in the mid-1890s, we once were men who knew how to defend the state in time of war. In 1896, Herzl confides to his diary that the Zionists should wait to establish colonies until they have a Jewish army that can defend them and eventually prevent the Jewish state from being dislodged from whatever landmass it might uh, find itself in. In a notorious diary entry from that period of June of 1895, where he's writing hundreds of pages, he writes blithely, albeit cursorily, about expelling natives from the territory of the future <coughs> Jewish state. The process of expropriation and removal, he writes, must be done discreetly <coughs> and circumspectly. And this one very brief quotation has received a great deal of uh, scholarly attention. And in that writing about Herzl's colonial policy, his views about the great powers, about the natives of whatever might become a Jewish state, 
Scholars tend to grant greater weight to Herzl's diary entries or private writings than to his public statements as gauges of his innermost thoughts. Now, for most people, that approach might make sense. After all, we're more likely to be sincere to ourselves and our friends than in the public sphere. But many of Herzl's most private remarks, particularly those made in the spring of 1895, were not confessions so much as fantasies, the products of an at times unbalanced mind. In public, Herzl literally put himself together. His carefully constructed, measured, and calculated statements made over and again over time were no less authentic than the private cries of a tortured yet unfocused psyche. Herzl, in other words, was psychologically exoskeletal, constructed from the outside in. Thus the centrality of Herzl's novel, Alt Neuland. On one level, it has been dismissed as a propaganda piece, an attempt to present Zionism to the world as attractive and honorable. Reflecting Herzl's own neurotic need for approval from Gentile society, we have the Prussian aristocrat King's Court, who consistently praises the achievements of Alt Neuland's new society. Tellingly, in an interfaith seder at the end of the novel, there is no rabbi or imam, but there are Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant clerics in attendance. The novel is set in Palestine, but its audience and its author are firmly placed in Europe. But this novel was much more than a public relations exercise. It was, in fact, the apple of Herzl's eye. Written over more than two years, whenever he could steal time away from the demands of his full-time job as the Neue Freie Presse's literary editor and the crush of Zionist work. Writing the novel gave Herzl a sense of purpose and no small amount of solace in the face of fruitless Zionist diplomatic activity. Alt Neuland's plot is clumsy. The novel is shot through with Eurocentrism, paternalism, misogyny, mawkishness, and adolescent wish fulfillment. It is also utterly sincere. And as is well known, it depicts a community that is not a sovereign state that has no defined borders or no army in which Arabs have not only not been expelled, but they have been welcomed into the new society. So to conclude, how do we make sense of a man as riven with contradictions as Herzl? A profoundly irrational man who couched his life project in the language of indisputable rational argument, who yearned for honor, but was steeped in shame, who saw in Zionism the road to authenticity while having no clear idea where that road would lead. People whose embrace of nationalism stems from deep psychological need, from feelings of shame, inferiority, or weakness, are liable to become martial, extremist, and maximalist. At the outset of his Zionist activity, Herzl started down that road, but he reversed course. Zionism was his life project, but Herzl's needs were entirely internally focused on imagining a Jewish state so that he could live comfortably as a European. Thus, Herzl sufficed with a disarmingly modest concept of the Jewish nation. And I'm going to read just briefly from an early essay of his, actually 1898. We are noticed. We are a group. A historical group of people who clearly belong together and have a common enemy. This seems to be adequate as a definition of a nation. I do not think the nation must speak only one language or show uniform racial characteristics. This quite moderate definition of nationhood is sufficient. We are a historical group of people, we clearly belong together, and we are held together by a common flaw. Herzl's Zionism was a reaction to arrested emancipation and social slights, not pogroms or existential threat. It was an expression of a search for purpose and a desire to be of consequence. Herzl flirted with fantasies of Jewish armed power, but within a couple of years he spoke for the remaining six years of his very brief Zionist career consistently in a softer political register, as in these remarks at the beginning of the Second Zionist Congress. If there is such a thing as a legitimate claim to any piece of the Earth's surface, then all the peoples of the Earth who believe in the Bible must recognize the right of the Jews. And they can do so without envy or concern, for the Jews are not a political power, and they never will be a political power again. Interesting words from the founder of political Zionism. A few moments later, Herzl added, 
This land cannot and never will become the property of any single great power, for it is the best guarded land of all. It is carefully guarded not only by its present proprietor, but by everyone else as well. Herzl's wavering loyalties between the Ottoman Empire, Germany, and Britain did not contradict his firm belief that any Jewish uh, state, even with a protectorate, the holy places in Jerusalem would remain extra commercium under international law. <coughs> Ironically, the author of the Jewish state was vague, unsure, and flexible about the form that that polity should take as a sovereign state, or a vassal, satrapy, or autonomous region. As Herzl said in a debate in Berlin in 1898, what is a state? A big colony. What is a colony? A small state. <laughs> For Herzl, not only the Jews' antiquity, but also their relative small size and powerlessness would ensure that the monotheistic world would trust the Holy Land in the hands of the Jews. They will guard and preserve it. Herzl felt supremely satisfied playing this, his favorite role. A good servant of the West, entrusted with the most precious terrain in the world, the Terra Santa. If all Herzl had was military strength, he would have the honor of a warrior. But Herzl wanted something more, the respect and trust of his fellow Europeans. Thank you.